So 2 Corinthians 5, verse 12. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may answer, have an answer for those that boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we beside ourselves, uh, for if, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all. And those who live, who, who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet uh, now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17, um, great changes take place um, when you begin your life as a Christian. Um, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, old things have passed away. So most of us here are, are some time past our conversion point. So, I, I don't know about y'all, when I was kind of prepping for this, I kind of had a thought that, Maybe I at times forget that I am a new creation. Maybe I, I've become complacent, for lack of a better word, in what happened at that point that I came up out of the water. Is that, did any, any of y'all ever think like that at all? Almost like it's taken for granted or you're just used to it. It's not. Yeah. And, and I don't, and that, that was kind of where I was with it when I started going through the study, I'm like, well, this this, this may be good for us to talk about, because most of us have been on, on the walk for a bit. But I think we need to revisit that frequently, because there's a lot that goes, I mean, if you read you know, what we just read in, you know, in verse 12 through 17, there's there's a lot that goes on. I mean, you know, when we come up out of the water, we've chosen to make that decision, and it's, you know, we contacted the blood of Christ. That's that's powerful. Um, so so what, is, what does this change mean? What, what position does this new creation hold in the eyes of God? How does God see us? Does he see the past with us? I have a hard time in my, my, my finite human mind. I have a really hard time understanding that, that that we can do something so simple as, as making that confession in front of people. So simple. Um, and and we, we turn away from, from things that in our life when we go down in the water, we come back up. And it's simple. It's not like in the Old Testament where you had to go and, you know, the, depending on, on what was being done, you had to slaughter an animal, you had to build an altar just so, you had to do all these things. And you still weren't forgiven. It just rolled things back. So, he sees us as new, and I know this. I know we're all we're all well along our walk here, but I think sometimes the the basic blocking and tackling stuff is stuff we need to look at because I think it makes us more effective as as Christians as we as we try to interact with other people and maybe show them um, the way to to life abundant, if you will. So our sins are not seen. What does that mean to to y'all? Get a fresh start. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, truly a new creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> kind of hard to, it's, I, for me, it's really hard to understand that. I mean. Hard to believe. <coughs> when you know God yeah. knows everything, yet he forgets that. How is that possible? Well, and if, you know, for me, it's like, you know, God knows the heart. And I'm sitting there going, that's a dirty, rotten place for me. Because there are times mm -hmm. I can still think some repugnant thoughts. What a crew served weapon on my vehicle for traffic. Get out of my way. Mm -hmm. I still fight with that. I try to put the old man down, but that, that new creation sometimes gets him in a headlock and does a pile driver on him, and other times it slips out. So here's a question. Yeah. We, we all know God forgives, right? But does he forgive and forget, or does he just forgive and say, I know what you did, but we're good? You know what I'm saying? You know, there's there's enough scripture that that basically says that if you've you know, if, if Christ is on your side and you've, you've obeyed and you've done what you're supposed to do, you stand before him with that advocate. Christ says, he's mine. And it's forgotten because, I mean, honestly, if it weren't forgotten. Yeah. And I think it's a choice for them to forget. 
because obviously he could yeah. be aware and know. I think it's a, a decision to yeah. not yeah. recall. It's it's and it's it's humbling to think about that. And that may be you know I know we as a, as a group in CIA we did first, second, and third John. You know the whole concept of am I saved? You know am I still saved? Kind of thing. And, and I think that may be something that we should look at again at some point in the future because if not collectively, individually, I think those are things we need to look at because it's really easy to forget that. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm moving in the direction I need to not not to the point where I'm once saved, always saved, but to the point where you have the assurance that through obedience and through continued moving forward that you're okay. Um, thoughts or comments before we kind of go to the next little point here? So what type of life are we to live as we come up as a new creation? You've been given a fresh start. What, what do you do from that point forward? The best you can. <clears throat> I, uh, my sister had a speech when you were for lads. Uh, had a really good example uh, that stuck with me. I didn't actually hear the speech. I, just, I, I read it. <laughs> Even. <Hey, then. laughs> um, so anyway, it was uh, it was talking about like when her and my sister were kids. Uh, there was snow on the ground, and they were trying to see who could make the straightest path to the tree. So uh, Leah said that she she walked and, and you know, made sure each foot was one right in front of the other to try to make the straightest path to the tree. And when she looked up, she was past the tree and had already, you know, because she was watching each individual step. And that my sister, Lauren, ended up making the straightest path to the, straight, to the tree, not because she was looking directly at her feet, making sure she was making every step straight as possible, but because she looked directly at the tree and walked towards the tree. Yeah. And yes. I think that that's a, a fair example. And I, I always think about that. Uh, it's a regularly. wonderful illustration. It's you know you, if you're look if you're watching each individual step and oh I messed up today oh I messed up today. oh I messed up today well you're never gonna you, your path is gonna be you know just they always talk about even in the woods you know like any map class you ever take when you're following a map you know you come up to a tree you go left you go right even though you try to go back if you're not you're not actually gonna be on course you have to follow what your compass says and track along with that. And it may not look like you're going straight, but you are because you're trying to get to that destination. Yeah. And I think a lot of people forget that. Um, yeah, and, and that type of life that we lead means that we keep our eye on what God wants us to do, which means we spend time in the Word. We spend yeah. time collectively with the saints. We spend time thinking on those things that are above instead of right here. Yeah, ex excellent point. So how does this affect our relationship with things pertaining to our old life? We're a new creation. What, is, what does that mean with our old life we have to do? Put it away. Sometimes that means leaving long-time friends. Some, sometimes it's, a, you know, it's, it's like people who struggle with addiction. I, when, when, when Dad finally got sober, you know, there, were, there were things he had to do and people he could not be around and, and even music he couldn't listen to because they all brought back that old, that old drunk self instead of the new sober self. So, yeah, there's it, it requires a change. Um, in Ephesians, we find the answers to these questions, and I just thought we would you know, kind of kind of go into that. So let's let's look really quickly. Um, go to uh, Ephesians two. And get over here really quick. Ephesians two, and we're going to start. Um, we're just going to read the first. Uh, let's see real quick here. Yeah, first seven or eight verses. And, and he and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive again with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up again together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and not of, our, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So our former condition, you know, two one tells us really clearly in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, uh, the spirit now who works in disobedience. It tells us we were dead. You were made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So our former condition is we were dead in, in you know, if we, you know, we didn't belong to God. Um, you know, we were actively seeking the world. We were, you know, whether, nobody wants to say, I follow Satan. Well, maybe some weirdo at the airport who's wanting to get you to go to the church of Satan. But, uh, I remember the 70s when you would have some of those folks in the airport, various folks trying to give you flowers and talk to you about their faith. You don't see that anymore. Thankfully, I guess that's one of the good things is post 9-11. Anyway, um, so, you know, nobody wants to say that they're following Satan, but if you're not following the will of God, Ultimately, that's what you're following, and and we see in two and three that you know verses two and three that it's it's you know, the desires of flesh and the mind are what made us children of wrath. So that that's our former condition, and I, I think as Christians we don't ever need to forget that. I think to some degree that makes us humble, and we need to we need to think on that before we get judging and condemning on people who are outside of Christ because they deserve grace and mercy just as much as anybody else. Just as much as we did. And it's really easy to come here and be around fellow Christians and say, hey, look at us, we're doing okay. We were all scumbags once. I think that if you are having, you know, if you see someone not a Christian, not whether limited um, knowledge of the Bible or what, and, and their actions obviously show that, and if your attitude is, I can't believe you would do that, think about, we do know. We do know better. We have been raised better. We have accepted it. And yet we still consciously, on a daily basis, make decisions. So how much better are we not? Because we know better, and yet we still fall short. You know, but we're not... It's not any better. We're not in an elevated status where we're allowed, you know, extra mistakes every day. They don't know. Yeah. We do. Which makes it even worse. And the, the saddest thing is when you see somebody who, who has been raised by godly parents in a, in, a, in a loving environment who have known the gospel of Christ, who obeyed the gospel of Christ, and then just take a hard turn away from it. That hurts me almost more than to see the the errant sinner who just doesn't know, because they've they've taken some they've taken this level of love and said I don't need that. I, I would think that's got to break God's heart. So, I, I would argue that it does uh, for sure. But I, at the same time, um, as someone who's had that happen in their life, uh, there comes a point, just like with the prodigal son. You, you, I wouldn't say I, you hit rock bottom, but you kind of note that my life was better with, you know, Jesus, not that Jesus or God ever left your life, but it was better when I was doing, when I was on that road. Oh, yeah. Like, whether you'll admit it or not, it was, you know, you may not have been having fun, quote unquote, but you, you for me, I noticed a difference in my quality of life. Uh, now, the act of living was easier. Right. I, I, that, that's what I noticed, that it was an easier life. I didn't worry as much. Right. That's you know, it, it just, you know, it's, you know what you're doing every Sunday. You know your preparation. You know Wednesday night I'm going to be here, you know, assuming nothing catastrophic happens. But it just, uh, an e it's an easier planned life because the, the plan is just, you know, what does God have in store for me today? And for, for me, and since, since we're kind of going down that, down that road, you know, for, for me, when I was away from, from, from the church and away from, from the Lord and, and living that life, um, when I came back, I noticed I slept better because I was able to go to God in prayer and say, Father, any trespass that I've done today, I'm sorry. And, and so my mind was focused on, on, on doing those things, and I could actually go to sleep knowing that, that, that by being back, in the ark of safety, that if there were any any trespass against me, I could ask for forgiveness. Whereas before, I didn't care, and I, if I died, I'd been I'd been stoking the fires of hell. So I did sleep better, and in that in that respect, it was an easier life because 
my mind was lighter, if you will, as light as my mind is, right? Anyway. So any other thoughts before we kind of press along? I was going to mention uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I went to speak to some college kids in uh, Florence, uh, UNA, on their, their Christian student center over there. And two of the main points that I try to make, um, when, they, when I was invited to speak, I said, you know, I'm not a preacher or like a youth minister. I said, no, no, we, we know that. And so they said, we actually wanted to speak to somebody who actually wasn't uh, a preacher or youth minister. I said, oh, okay. And so they wanted to hear from somebody. They're trying to go through a series of different people who have just different businesses who aren't really like their job not to preach every, every single day, um, which our job sort of is. But anyways, um, they said, uh, two points I drove home, but as we kind of wrapped up, I said, you know, our, our job, quote unquote, every day, our sole purpose from when we wake up, when we go to bed, is to bring glory to God. And so when you develop your schedule and who you go meet with and who you choose to associate with, uh, the places you go, the events you attend, um, that's the question you have to ask yourself. It is what I'm doing and, and my speech and my actions and who I'm uh, you know, associating with, is it, is it bringing glory to God? And so some of the kids, and I know I was when I first got to college, um, I had some high school friends that I didn't really want to say goodbye to because we had gone through some of them since elementary school, all the way junior high and high school. We had a lot of experiences together. But some of them chose to go and get involved in worldly things and uh, clubs and alcohol and things like that. And, um, that was difficult when I went to college. I hanged out with my friends for years. You know, I really want to say goodbye to them, but they didn't really want to turn loose of, of some of the fun stuff, I guess, as, as Tyler mentioned, you know, whatever fun may be to you. Um, but that was a, a difficult uh, transition, I think, in my freshman and sophomore year, saying, okay, well, that's, that's not really bringing glory to God. And then you, you are the, the sum about the five people that you hang out with. So I said, who you become in your Christian walk you're going to have to say bye bye to some people, and that's that's difficult sometimes. So, you know, when you decide that I'm going to put away an old self, like we talked about earlier, um, where you know the way I, I speak and who I am associated with, um, the ultimate question that you have to ask yourself is, am I bringing glory to God? And when that's your job and that's your purpose, it, it's it's fairly simple when you look at it that way. Oh, absolutely. But my dad was, was Colossians 3.17. You know, whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Yeah, we, that, that is our job. And you're right, it's funny. You, you said, well, we're not, we're not a preacher. Right. We're not a paid preacher, not right? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, no, that's excellent. That's, that's an excellent point. So, we, yeah, we do. We have to leave some of those behind. Um, I, wouldn't trade, I wouldn't trade where I am right now for anything because the best church family I've ever had and I've got some of the closest friends I've ever had and I like the work we do here I'm, I'm thankful to be a part of this congregation and I look forward to whatever it brings moving forward so our current condition um, so out of love and mercy and grace we were dead and now we're alive we see that in Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 um, let's flip really quickly to Romans uh, 5 uh, verses 6 and 8 Quick. And if you get it, feel free to read it because my thumbs are not working real well today. For while we were yet weak in due season, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. For preadventure for the good man, someone even dare to die. Yeah. Can you read verse 8 for me, too? Oh, sorry. That's okay. But, but God commended his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't ever want us to forget that. <clears throat> While we were sinners, and you can insert whatever word you want there. Ugly, nasty, repugnant, vile, scumbags, whatever word you want to. That's what we were when we were away from Christ. Yet he still died for us. All those people in, in, in the Balkans who tried to kill me, Christ died for them. So I should harbor no grudge for that. And I should hope and pray for them that they're able to find Christ. And that they can find that, because if not, they're lost. The old me would be like burning hell suckers. <clears throat> the new me prays for those folks. Um, something to think about because we we need to think about that. Out of mercy, love, and grace, we are we were dead, now we're alive, and we're blessed because we've been raised with Christ. And I think Ephesians two six. I mean, I think 
the verse is really interesting because if we look at Ephesians 2, 6, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's what we've been, that's what we've been raised for. So, you know, to think about being able to go home and be with the Father. You know, I think about when I was away from, from the Lord and, and now that I'm back, you think about that and it's, I, I, don't, I don't know about you, Tyler, but when I, when I, was, when I was there, um, the fear of death, I mean, I had, I had the fear of death because back in my mind, I knew that there was nothing for me other than what I had right there. And I don't want to die now because i got a little girl that I, I need to see that she goes down the right path, but um, it's a different fear of death. I'm not worried about going home. At times I look forward to going home because this world's kind of nasty at times. And I think that's the great thing. We've been made to sit in the heavenly places through this conversion process. Um, in various explanations I'm giving the church um, heaven proper, the spiritual the spiritual realm. You know, the church is, uh, let's look at uh, verse, let's see, Ephesians 3.10 real quick. Uh, to that intent now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So, you know, we've, we've been made to know about these things to come. Um, and it's interesting to think about that spiritual realm. As Christians, I think you know it's really easy to be in this world and to forget that there's a world to come. We've got kids to take care of. We've got business things to take care of. We've got you know a new career to take care of. We have all these things that can be distractions. At the end of the day, we have to remember the spiritual things to come. And that's that we're, we're spirits with bodies, not bodies with the spirit. And that's easy to forget. Um, any thoughts sir, before we kind of press ahead? Okay, so um, let's compare a position with Christ in heavenly places. Where is, where is Christ seated? Yeah. Ephesians 1.20 um, which he worked with Christ, uh, let's see, which he worked us believing according, uh, I'm sorry, these bifocals are killing me today. That's what happens when you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go to bed till 5. So, let's see here. 120, uh, which he worked in Christ when he was raised from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So, you know, we, we think about that, and it's, you know, we're being prepared to be in that place. Thinking about being, you know, Christ the perfect being came here, our, our advocate, lived with us, among us, saw what we're capable of, the good, the bad, and the extremely ugly. Yet we're being prepared to go where he is. Um, our position with Christ certainly warrants a proper frame of mind. Um, let's look really quickly at Colossians 3. Uh, let's see, Colossians 3, we'll do 1 and 2. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Uh, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on these things above and not on things of the earth. Not, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For uh, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I, I think about those, those first four verses there and it's, it's such a beautiful promise. You know, we have the opportunity. We set our minds on things above and not on the earth. I, I don't know about y'all, but that's hard for me. Um, I, I think about just getting called up, caught, even caught up into everything that goes on in the world, it's, it's a challenge. Um, try to spend more time in the Word. I try to, you know, we, we try to a lot of our conversations at home are spiritually focused, but it's still really, really hard to keep that in the forefront of your mind. Did anybody, anybody else struggle with, with that at all? Mm -hmm. I don't know some practical applications other than prayer and more time in word and more time with the saints but 
I mean, that's, we, we've, got, we, we've got to do that. Um, you know, so we've been called to seek out those things, and we have to put our minds above to the things that, that really matter. Um, I think about, you know, First and Second Peter, we keep reading about, all oh, this is going to burn out. So at the end of the day, what's really important, it's not here. Um, as a new creation sitting with Christ in heavenly places, we ought to think about that. Um, we should also behave that way for a new creation. We are, we should, you know, we should act like that. Um, that's a challenge at times too. You know, I think it's, it, the problem with losing sight on where we're supposed to go sometimes changes how we act. Is that a fair statement? If we keep our mind off of that, maybe certain things become acceptable that really aren't. Is that? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think leaving new creations, babies, they're dependent, you know. Yeah. I think that is huge with, um, you know, when you do become a Christian, you should be dependent on him. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think sometimes our own mindset is, oh, I can do this, I've got it, I can do this, I'll schedule it here, I'll, I'll put this here, I'll do time here, done. Um, and it's, you know, and I think, you know, he wants us to be more dependent and more focused and leaning on him instead of trying to do it. And that's that's hard being dependent, isn't it? As as adults who you know, manage pretty much every aspect of our life, it's hard to say that I need somebody else. Just in the realm of anxiety and worrying yeah. and, you know, as parents and, you know, leaders of households and you typically are going to internalize and go, okay, well, I have to do this, I need to do this, what about this, when this happens, if this happens, and so much of that isn't necessary. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think we have to, you know, we, we need to, to walk worthy of our calling, and, and in that, you know, we have to walk in love, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, you know, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We're supposed to walk in love. And sometimes when we're not being dependent on the Lord for all these things and we're not walking in that, think about how love diminishes too. It's really easy to get snotty with somebody in traffic or rude people in the airport. That, that's my favorite. I love watching rude people in the airport. Just little things, like, but it's really but we have to love them, right? I mean, that's you know when we when we're not dependent on the Lord, I think we forget what our blessings are. Well, uh, I go to Publix, and there's too many rude people. I know. I, I struggle with it every day. <laughs> Always tell the kids you don't have to like them, but you have to love them. Yeah, so I, I don't care if you like everybody in your class, but you have to be kind and you have to show them love <clears> the way you yeah. want them to show you which is not easy as a child, and it's really not easy as an adult because in our heads we're thinking, you don't deserve this, you don't deserve I dare say it's easier. This, you know? I dare say it's easier for a child because their frontal lobe's not fully developed, you know? Ours is, and we can process all this yeah. stuff, and this guy's a jerk, you know? I mean, it's... <laughs> I've, I've tried to adopt a, a more uh, tolerant policy, especially in traffic. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> because of something, something Norman said to me one time. Uh, he said, uh, just let them go. They're running interference for you. Yeah. They're the one who's the cops going to see first. You know, things like that. Yeah. Running interference for you. And I always, I always say that in my mind. Thank you for running that interference for me. I, 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 do, I, I do a similar thing when I, because I do back roads. I don't do the interstate anymore. I kind of like to drive fast. I like, the, I like back roads. I can see the countryside. Finding a bathroom's a challenge. Got to make dirt roads for it. Anyway, um, but I think about. What's that? Not everybody can use those. <laughs> uh, that's not that true. <laughs> Everybody's got the spirit. That's right. <laughs> but, but, I mean, for me, I think about any delay that I get. It's like, okay, you know, maybe that's the Lord keeping me from an accident. I, I, try, to, I try to think like that. So, yeah, run an interference for me. Or they're on their way to a hospital because somebody's dying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give them benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we have to walk worthy of our calling. Any, anything else? Because I didn't need to, like, shift anything, so... I think, um, you know, we tend to, like, compartmentalize the different aspects of our life. So, like, we go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, and maybe we schedule, like, Bible study during the week, and we have our, we pray in the morning, we pray at night, we pray before meals, and it just becomes, like, part of the checklist. And I've been, I read a lot of, like, you know, mother 
uh, reading plans and things like that and devotionals and stuff. And one I read recently said, you have to invite God into the little moments into your life and, or in your life. So like when you're about to lose it to your, you know, on your kids, that's the time that you invite, you say the prayer, like, please take over and help me get through this. And like, but we, everything is always so like, it's, th- that's not the time for this. This is a schedule here, you know? Yeah. So we have to like make it a habit that like we, everything in our life, God's invited to control us rather than like, you know, you have to invite him when you're in traffic. You have to take the time to be like, okay, I'm not going to lose yeah. it today. When I was commuting 45 minutes, one, one way, uh, working in Fayetteville, I, I, before I started my car, I'd get in, it didn't matter if it was hot, it didn't matter if it was cold, before I started my car, I, I would pray just that because it's like, there's people out there, the world's people mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's the X factor in this world, you know? Yeah, I get it. I absolutely get it. Um, you know, and I think about too, um, let me find where we were here. Um, in, in verse, let's see, uh, in Ephesians 5, you know, verse 11, it's it's kind of interesting that uh, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them for it's shameful, it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done in the secret. But in all things that are exposed made manifest by the light, for whatever manifests is light, uh, therefore he says, awake ye who sleep, arise from the dead. <clears throat> And Christ will give you light. So, you know, I think we, we need to keep ourselves separated from those. We, we don't need to have fellowship with those things in darkness. I think it's one thing that helps us be worthy of, of, of the, the calling that we've been, you know, we've been made. We also have to understand that time is short, and we have to understand the will of the Lord, and that, that involves a lot of a lot of time in study and in prayer and and just in fellowship. I mean, we can't underestimate the fellowship with one another. I mean, it's 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 an important aspect of growing as a Christian is to have this because that's it all hand and gloves together we have to spend time in the word we have to know the word but we fellowship together some of y'all may know the Bible better than me and, and it's very likely that you do and I think about the fellowship that we get together like that it, it, it helps us gel together in our walk um, you know we have to we have to be strong in the Lord uh, we have to realize that you know Ephesians six twelve tells us that, that we're engaged in spiritual warfare. Um, you know, for we not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. We, we have to remember that we are engaged in spiritual combat. And when you prep for a mission in the military, you don't just get your, your TA-50 gear and go, okay, let's go fight. There are months of preparation to learn how to use your gear. There are months of preparation to maintain your weapon system, whatever that is. There are months of preparation on getting physically fit to be able to withstand the rigors of battle. We need to realize that for us because we need to know how to use our sword we have to know how to use this, to know how to use it with love. And that's not something that happens overnight. You just can't. I can't give Liberty Grace this and go, here you go, kid. Go with God. I've got to train her from now until she gets to where she can make the decision what she needs to do with this. I need. We need to do that now for all of our children because at some point, whether you want to admit it or not, they're in the battle now. The devil wants them. <coughs> It's our jobs to make sure they go the direction they need to go. And that's, that's the other part that's important about, it's, and whether you have kids or not, even if you don't have kids, the influence you have with people who are lost, you have an opportunity to, to help direct them to a home eternal. Um, the bell has rang. Some people might want to go to the restroom without their children, so I'm going to dismiss early. Always my hearing. So, Amen. thank you guys. Praise the Lord. <laughs> It used to be less important to me, but it's actually very important now. Thank you.